point where you can be happy to have been born a human. Birth, old age, sickness and death, we can't fool around with these ultimate facts. Reality, getting a handle on this must be our goal. Don't get stuck in categories. It's strange that not a single person seriously considers his own life. For ages we've been carrying around something uncooked, and we comfort ourselves with the fact that it's the same for the others too. That's what I call group stupidity, thinking that we just have to be like the others. Satori means creating your own life. It means waking up from group stupidity. In a part of Manchuria, the carts are pulled by huge dogs. The driver hangs a piece of meat in front of the dog's nose, and the dog runs like crazy to get at it. But of course he can't. He's only thrown his meat after the cart has finally reached its destination. Then, in a single gulp, he swallows it down. It's exactly the same with people and their paychecks. Until the end of the month, they run after the salary hanging in front of their noses. Once the salary is paid, they gulp it down and they're already off, running after the next payday. Nobody can see further than the end of their nose. Everyone believes that their life somehow has meaning, but they're really no different from swallows. The males gather food, the females sit on the eggs. Most people aren't following any clear approach to life. They get by with makeshift methods, like rubbing lotion on a cramped shoulder. The question is, why are you straining your forehead so much? If you aren't careful, you'll spend your whole life doing nothing besides waiting for your ordinary person hopes to someday be fulfilled. In the world, people are always saying, I want to do this, I want to do that. But when they actually do it, there isn't anything to it at all. You read the advice column in the newspaper. Just be careful that you don't end up, at the, end up there with your little problem too. No matter how you look at it, everything in the world revolves around food and sex. Imagine some chicks have found an earthworm and are now fighting over it. That's exactly how human society looks. Like an avalanche growing as it falls into the valley, the suffering beings of the six worlds become more and more deeply entangled in their illusions. Zazen means putting an end to this. People in the world only understand what's useful. And where has that brought us? Nowhere. The fight between the cat and the horse over the definition of happiness has apparently never come to an end. This is because, oh sorry, so don't believe what the fortune tellers say. How you need to live your life isn't fixed. It's said that some people are trapped by their money. What is it they do with their money anyway? The satisfaction everyone in the world looks for is followed by dissatisfaction. The happiness that the world talks about gives way to unhappiness. Illusion means not having any direction in life, and since those lacking direction gather in groups, it's natural that there are hooligans who beat each other up, and it also isn't any wonder when wars break out for no reason at all. Humans make an intelligent face while groping around in the dark. When you get used to this strange world of impermanence, it seems completely normal to you, and although it's obvious that survival in this impermanent world is more difficult than Zazen, it seems to you to be the other way around as if Zazen were harder than life. We've gotten used to this life. Only because of this do we find it normal. Your body is like a pimple. Even a beggar laughs. Even a jackpot winner sooner or later cries again. Money isn't what it's all about. Everything useful is illusory. No matter how special they seem, useful things are illusory. Things which are good for nothing, however, aren't so artificial. Nothing can be gained from them. Everything is relative. Even the most important thing in the world is only relative. What is beyond all this is the absolute. It's no small matter to be born into this world as a human being. So what a shame it would be if you went crazy and ended up in an asylum, or if you constantly complained about having no money, or if you lost your mind because you'd just fallen in love and then were completely overcome with grief because she left you, and so on and so forth. Now that you've been born as a human being, you should lead a life which is truly worth living. Buddhism teaches us that it's a joy to be born into this world as a human being. Samadhi means asking yourself the question, how to live? Everyone believes that satisfaction doesn't mean anything more than laying on the couch or dozing in a hot spring. No, satisfaction means being suffused with joy, tranquility and happiness. Only when you've fully arrived in the present instant will you experience true joy tranquility and happiness. Ordinary people are blown around the six worlds by their desires, and for them there is only love or hate, profit or loss, good or bad, victory or loss.
But in the end, we have to realize that none of that is good for anything. And so in the end, we come to the practice of Zazen, simply practicing what isn't good for anything. Ordinary person is the expression for someone who gropes around in the dark, led astray by confusion. What is this confusion really? In the end, it doesn't have any substance. That's why being led astray by confusion is like playing tug of war with the clouds. There's nothing final about winning or losing. Nevertheless, you cry with joy when you win and cry with pain when you lose. How stupid. This substanceless, substanceless, beyond winning and losing, is the true form of all phenomena. A Buddha is someone who untangles the confused. A person who understands things is a person who doesn't let himself be misled by his personal fabrications and karma. People who don't understand things are constantly looking for distraction. Sometimes they fall in love. Sometimes they get drunk. Sometimes they dedicate themselves to reading. Sometimes they do their sport. But they do all of this only half-heartedly, in order to somehow deceive themselves. Spending our daily lives fooling around in this half-hearted way is what's called life in the floating world. That means that our wobbly legs are carrying us off track. All the nations of the world are stupefied with boredom. That's why they say, right, left, march in step, and the children are fighting over their toys again. People wheeze from exhaustion their whole life long, without even knowing what they're wearing themselves out for. It only seems as if they had had a goal. In truth, there's absolutely nothing there. Only our grave awaits. We can only be at peace when we understand things as they are. When we understand things, we see the universe with a single glance, and the scene between ourselves and the universe van vanishes. We were born within non-thinking. We were simply born and we will simply die. And you ask about the meaning of life? You ask what Zazen is good for? Whereby you'd have no right to complain if you had died already last year. Isn't it clear from the start that life is good for nothing? It is simply coming and going. That is all. Oops. <clears throat> it is simply coming and going. That is all. Your problem is that there's something in you that just can't accept that. Scientists observe insects in a terrarium eating their food or each other, mating or chirping away, in the same way we are in everything we do under the eye of reality. Okay, so the, the themes that I've picked out um, from this chapter are two again. <clears throat> so why, you know, why are you worrying about the meaning of your life? And also, are you making the best use of your life as a human being? Do you actually know how to enjoy, enjoy your life? So the first um, quote is, you know, what a shame it is to be born a human being and spend your whole life worrying. Um, I think many people these days kind of, you know, have uh, some sort of, you know, depression or, you know, they, they, they kind of have some sort of struggle with the world. Um, uh, I'm I'm not I'm not to be honest exactly sure how to explain it, but you know I, I think it's you know from my experience I've seen you know seen a lot of people sort of struggling with this sort of thing. Um, when I was a teenager, I was you know I, I would get you know sort of really bummed out at the time. I didn't really understand why, but I just had these sort of feelings, um, and I was constantly trying to find some sort of meaning uh, into in my life. Um, you know I put uh, my energy into many things. Uh, I was constantly shifting what I did. Uh, I would, you know, become obsessed with one thing and put all my energy into it, and then I would jump onto the next. Um, you know, because this, I, I guess maybe this kind of feeling of, you know, what is this all about, kind of thing, was always there, and I was trying to find some sort of way to add direction to my life. So after a while, you know, I, I started to think that, you know, life really was just meaningless. Um, you know, there wasn't anything to it it was just you know there was just nothing um so you know i started trying to uh, you know I, I kind of embraced this uh, feeling of you know nothingness and kind of looked into it i was started reading um i started reading you know existentialist philosophy and i became interested in this guy albert camus and his ideas about absurdism so he basically just said that you know everything was absurd uh, had no meaning and you just sort of deal with that um, you know, and I, I, when I read it, I thought, oh, this is great. You know, I had this kind of like epiphany. Oh, you know, this is really, you know, how I feel. So, 
you know, I thought I'd find a sort of answer. Oh, this is how you, this is how it's spelt out. This is great. Um, so yeah, he talked about this absurdity of trying to find meaning uh, in like an irrational and chaotic universe. And his ideal example was from um, Greek mythology. He used um, this the myth of Sisyphus, who was basically he was like some king who got too big for his boots, and he basically annoyed the gods. So then they sent him to Hades and then Hades, you know, there's like these different people in Greek mythology who got these sort of eternal punishments. Like one was a guy who was eternally hungry and like trying to get an apple. And then Sisyphus was that he had to uh, constantly roll a boulder up a hill. And every time it got to the top of the hill, it went down again. And uh, for, for Albert Camus, he thought this was like a perfect example of, you know, what life is. You know, you're just kind of constantly putting all your energy into this thing that, is meaningless you know you're pushing your this boulder up the hill and then it falls down and uh you know for him the only sort of you know i guess compensation for that was this idea that after sisyphus had pushed it and then it goes down again oh great but whilst he was walking down the hill he was you know he was sort of thinking um he was accepting his situation and him the fact that he went down the hill to push it up again meant that you know he was kind of you know, accepting it, accepting this endless kind of suffering. So, yeah, for some reason, I thought this was great. But, you know, I think a lot of people these days, uh, you know, they don't believe really in anything. Um, and they embrace this meaninglessness. Um, you know, they're happy to be this uh, Manchurian dog with a piece of meat in front of their nose. Um, but, you know, after a while, I came to realise perhaps that, you know, this really wasn't so great, this sort of way of thinking, just like everything is meaningless and whatever, just deal with it and, you know, embrace this meaninglessness. Um, you know, I think perhaps, you know, maybe this was like a good diagnosis of the problem, but, you know, there was no solution. There was no way to live. Um, as Kodo says, you know, most people aren't following any clear approach to life. They get by with makeshift methods like rubbing lotion on a cramped shoulder. So I think these days people just, uh, you know, going back to this want to do or should do, people just do what they want to do. You know, they, uh, when it's the weekend, they just find something that, uh, you know, do what makes you happy, do something that makes you feel good. So I don't know, they get very drunk or I don't know, they go bowling or something. But yeah, something really just temporary, like, I don't know, this is just like something that makes you feel good for the day or something like this. So then Kodo says, a person who understands things is a person who doesn't let himself be misled by his personal fabrications and karma. So, you know, what he's suggesting here is that, you know, you, you don't actually, you shouldn't actually just say, oh, I'm just going to do what I feel or, you know, I just feel like doing this or I'll see how I feel later. You have to think, try and think beyond this kind of thing. Um, I think, you know, this is, this is very hard. Like, I think feelings are very strong. And uh, it's very hard to kind of train yourself to really go beyond them. You know, they're there, you know, in every sort of scenario, you've got this kind of, I don't know what it is, just like a feeling about certain things. Um, so, yeah, you have, to, you have to kind of understand things, as he says. You have to, you know, know what's going on. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, yeah, so, you know, when I was a teenager, I was feeling this way you know, kind of questioning what life was all about. And then I went to university and, you know, things were really fun. And I just had a lot of fun, basically, and didn't really need to worry about anything. So these kind of feelings went away. Um, but then, yeah, I don't know. I think they, they came back again. I think this is like this kind of bolder scenario where you're pushing things up and then things come down and whatever. You're kind of stuck in this cycle, as Kodo said in the last chapter, you know, this kind of wheel of suffering begins. Um, another quote from this section, people who don't understand things are constantly looking for distraction, but they do all of this only half-heartedly. Spending our lives fooling ourselves in this half-hearted way is what's called life in the floating world. Our wobbly legs are carrying us off track. Now, I think this idea of um, half-heartedness is, you know, this is very harsh. Uh, it's true, but it's it's very harsh. Like, because, you know, I think people, you know, when they live their life, most people just want to be happy. They're just looking for happiness. Uh, and you do all sorts of things and you're trying to build this sort of, I guess, maybe like a routine of 
happiness, like this sort of, you know, you do your work and then you get the reward and, you know, you just want to kind of make sure that the amount of happiness you experience outweighs all the shit that comes at you. But, you know, a lot of the things that we do are, we it's true, we only do this half-heartedly. I mean, there's no real direction because we don't know, really, a, a lot of people just don't know what to do with their life. They don't know how to spend the time that they have. So, yeah, it's really difficult. And I think uh, this half-heartedness kind of, you know, appears in everything, really. I think it's constantly there, like, uh, yeah. So when I read this, I feel like these, these are kind of words that kind of pierce quite deeply through, you know, a lot of the things that you go through when you're just living in society. Um, so, yeah, w when I was young, I grew up, you know, I was obsessed with culture. Uh, I guess it was kind of, you know, when he talks about rubbing lotion or whatever, filling a sort of hole. I, I had this sort of outpouring of interest in music and this kind of thing, and I was obsessed with it. Um, so after university, you know, I, I got a job for this magazine. It was like a cool magazine. And I really thought, you know, that my life had direction now. It was like all this time before, I, you know, I was all this worrying about, oh, what is this meaning of life, blah, blah, blah. Now I had this kind of thing. Um, but, you know, funny enough uh, and ironically enough, it was during this time that I felt like probably the most lost. Uh, you know, I felt, I, and I, I, I don't really know why. I had this direction. I had this, you know, career ahead of me. Um, and you know, it was something that I was good at. I was able to do do it well. Um, but yeah, for some reason, this I just couldn't. Yeah, I just didn't feel like you know this direction really was was anything. As Kodo says, illusion means not having any. Illusion means not having any direction in life. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think it also can mean that. Sometimes when you, you know, when you do think you have direction, actually, you know, you, you don't. Um, a lot of people are very satisfied or think they're very satisfied with their career and they have this vision of, you know, everything in front of them or this kind of, you know, future. And then once they reach that point, they look behind and think, oh, how great all of that was. Um, but yeah, I think this is not the direction he's talking about here. Um, so yeah, it was during this time actually when I was working at the magazine that I started sitting Zazen. Uh, it was, I guess, you know, coincidentally, but it was quite an appropriate time really, because yeah, I was losing this kind of, uh, you know, I was questioning this sort of, you know, what I was doing with my life again. I had direction now, whereas when I was a teenager I didn't, but there was still this sort of, you know, feeling of doubt about what, you know, what I was doing with my life. Um, so yeah, I, I started sitting Zazen and uh, at the beginning, um, you know, it was, it felt really great. It was like this kind of, you know, sort of honeymoon phase. I mean, the last chapter we were talking about love. Um, and yeah, you kind of, at the beginning when you sit Zazen, it's like, it's an amazing feeling. It's, uh, you know, suddenly things seem a lot clearer. Um, but over time, you know, I, I think these sort of uh, feelings of doubt and these niggling sort of things came back um, but I think this time you know I, I think it was a different situation because you know like Kodo says in the last uh, chapter he talks about looking at things through the eyes of Zazen so <clears throat> maybe at the beginning I was thinking oh you know this is actually you know kind of a solution to these all these feelings of doubt and stuff I have of life but <clears throat> I think uh, you know the fact that they came back uh, actually, really, when you sit Zazen, it doesn't matter. You know, like uh, Ekasan was demonstrating the other day with this, you know, this water and the cloudy water and the dirty water. But either way, the, the, the cloudiness will always be there. The dirt will always be at the bottom of the glass. Um, and I think, you know, basically these things don't matter so much. So, yeah, another quote that Koda uses is, you know, we were simply born and we will simply die. And you ask about the meaning of life. It is simply coming and going, that is all. Your problem is that there's something in you that just can't accept that. So yeah, this is another, you know, very like harsh but true thing that, you know, you, you know you're going to die. Um, you're worrying about your life. You're worrying about what the point in, is in it. But, you know, there's just something in you that just can't accept it. So, yeah, for me, I, I don't know. I think these sort of doubts, perhaps, 
will never end or you know I'm not interested really in kind of trying to you know kind of rub lotion and make the feelings go away but you know with Zazen I think I, I've learned how to react to these things and not let them kind of you know drag me around and send me in every which direction um, yeah so as Kodo says <clears throat> ordinary person ordinary person is the expression for someone who gropes around in the dark, led astray by confusion. What is this confusion really? In the end, it doesn't have any substance. That's why being led astray by confusion is like playing tug of war with the clouds. So, I mean, here actually it's quite, you know, he, whereas some of these other examples are quite harsh, this is, you know, he's actually being quite hopeful here. He's just saying, you know, you're worrying so much about the things that are happening in your life, or you're worrying about what your life is, but really... You know what is this worry like? What you know? What is it? it? It's it's nothing really. You're just you know playing tug of war with the clouds. So you know stop worrying. You're not this kind of you know lost person basically. Um, another point actually that I wanted to look at was um, the way in many of these quotes that uh, Kodo Sawaki compares humans to animals. Uh, a lot of them are you know pretty humorous, but most I mean they're all kind of like you know quite damning of the human race um so you know it makes me wonder does you know does he think that he's better than ordinary people i mean he's comparing them to animals um or is he just trying to help here i think um you know with, some, with a lot of religions it's like a very unattractive quality that you know that they kind of present themselves as being better than others that you know they have this kind of monopoly on the suffering and this kind of thing you know i, I find it's it's just like a massive turn off for me but I think in these examples with, with the animals, I think, you know, although they're quite harsh, uh, I think he's just asking us to look at, you know, our, our own problems, honestly. Um, as he said in the, you know, in the last chapter, basically, you know, we're not special. There's nothing special about being a human being. I mean, you know, we have all this sort of, I guess, you know, other religions or stuff create this whole sort of story about why it's so amazing that we're human beings and that, you know, this is some sort of magnificent creation. But, you know, really, it's, it's you're, you're no different from anything else. You're no different from, you know, that dog who's just had sex or whatever. Like, there's no difference. Yeah, he says here, stop trying to be something special and just be what you are. You just need to accept, you know, you, you need to be able to see honestly you know, what, what it is that you are as a human. Um, you know, and people often use this excuse, like, uh, you know, oh, he or she's only human, like, I don't know, maybe like a rock star is having sex with loads of women. Oh, he's just a human being. You know, how could he help it? These women are throwing themselves on him. Or something like this, you know, for their mistakes. Um, but I think, you know, I think, you know, while Kodo is saying that we're no different from animals, He's also, you know, there's also this idea that we're not, while we're not different from animals, we're also not different from anything at all. We're, we're, there's no separation between us and the entire universe. So perhaps you might think, oh, it's, oh, it's a bit harsh. He's just saying I'm like, I'm like a dog that's just had sex. But actually, you know, I think what he's saying is that, you know, that there is nothing special to being human. But at the same time, you know, why are you worrying so much about being a human? Why are you worrying so much about this life in human society? Like, there is no separation between you and anything else at all. He says, We can only be at peace when we see things as they are. When we understand things, we see the universe with a single glance, and the scene between ourselves and the universe vanishes. I think, you know, some of the things that Kodo is saying in this, in this section, or that the editor has put together, is, you know, He's actually asking us to, rather than just criticising humans, he's actually just saying that we should you know, find a genuine way to enjoy our lives. Um, you know, satisfaction isn't just about fulfilling desires. As he says, everyone believes that satisfaction doesn't mean anything more than laying on the couch or dozing in a hot spring. No, satisfaction means being suffused with joy, tranquility and happiness. Only when you've fully arrived in the present instant will you experience true joy tranquility and happiness now i mean this is quite an ultimate message really is you know he's trying to hammer it into you that you know what you think you, you know what you think you're doing which is helping you or you know causing happiness in your life actually you know it's, it's nothing you're just sort of trying to rub lotion on on on, an, on a wound um he's actually suggesting that there there is something uh, you know better 
um, yeah, for him, you know, he says, it's no small matter to be born into this world as a human being. You know, he doesn't want us to waste our lives. This is what he's saying here. Like, don't take it for granted. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, it's quite hard maybe to find a way to, to do that, how to actually, you know, take care of your life. Like the, the thing we were talking about the other day with the, with the quote from the Lotus Sutra, you know, this is your life. Like, you know, this, this uh, is your house. You should take care of it. But, you know, you have to somehow find a way. And I think uh, if you spend your life just being dragged around by how you feel and doing what you want, uh, you know, you'll never reach that point. Um, and in order to do this, in order to, you know, as he says, now that you've been born a human being, you should lead a life worth living. Um, we have to be able to see things as they are. Um, so to, to end this, I want to try and, I mean, this, this final quote on, on part four is quite a tricky one, but going on from what I've just said about, you know, seeing things honestly, um, let me see if I can So this final thing he says, uh, and it kind of relates to the animal thing. Scientists observe insects in a terrarium eating their food or each other, mating or chirping away. In the same way we are in everything we do under the eye of reality. Um, so I find, yeah, this is actually, you know, perhaps, you know, quite hard to uh, kind of break down this, this idea. But this, this thing of uh, everything we do, is under the eye of reality. So what is he saying here that, about reality? You know, is uh, reality some separate thing from us that's watching us? Like, is it, you know, some other thing um, that's observing us the same way a scientist observes an insect? But you know, going back to this quote of, you know, seeing things as they are, and then the scene between ourselves and the universe vanishes. So then, if if I myself am not separate from the universe and I am part of one big reality, perhaps here he's suggesting that. The, things under the eye of reality is that in every instance um, you know we, we are able to see ourselves clearly like uh, you know if we're going to live this life that's worth living we have to somehow you know rise above um, the, the clouds of delusion or our personal karma or whatever you want to call it and see things for ourselves um, and yeah I think perhaps you know this is what he means here with this eye of reality that you know th th this is actually us like everything that we see is us and if we're able to see, you know, beyond the things that are just satisfying or whatever, then perhaps, you know, this kind of message of living something that's worth living and not wasting our lives as a human being uh, is actually possible. Um, OK, so that's all from me. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Should we all